Hi, everybody. All right, hope everybody's doing well. Um, we are uh, really excited to have Frank Rudich uh, this week to talk to us about um, ethics of using AI in surgery. Frank is a faculty affiliate with the schwartz schuster Institute, as uh, well as a professor in the Department of Com Computer Science and at, at Vector. And uh, he is, uh, he works, uh, many of you will know Frank, but he works in machine learning and healthcare, especially natural language processing, speech recognition and, and surgical safety. And he is, although I think J Frank, you were just telling me this is now, uh, you, you, you were the inaugural chair of the subcommittee of the Standards Council of Canada on Artificial Intelligence and he's the far uh, chair in artificial intelligence. Um, so we will get started. He's talking on the allegory of the OR, ethics and anesthetics and cybernetics. Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay, great. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I was saying before uh, we started um, that there was a lot of material that I was hoping that we'd be able to add uh, today, but I managed to sneak in a couple of, of um, kind of concepts that I'd be really happy to discuss either in this meeting or with any of you after afterwards. Um, so I think I have to do the normal um, uh, conflict, conflict of interest uh, slide um, because I'll talk about some of the work that these groups are doing. Um, I'm a co-founder of Winterlight Labs um, and I have like patents and shares with them and I'm a director of AI at Surgical Safety Technologies a company as, as was just mentioned and I have patents options and a salary there. Uh, so this is today's set list. Um, I'm going to play uh, some stuff that I think a lot of you have already seen and might even expect. Um, so we'll have a lot of that. And then I've tried to insert some new stuff that uh, nobody really wants to listen to, um, uh, but I, I want to say, I want to play it. So we're going to be putting that uh, throughout this, this, uh, this set list as well. Uh, so generally, um, I want to talk about the kind of some risks of, of deep learning, in particular around healthcare. Um, talk about a couple of different ways you might be able to mitigate against those risks, um, including using explainable AI. Um, from there, I want to talk a little bit about the potential of deep learning in the operating room, uh, and then branch off on some ethical considerations of AI in surgery and healthcare. Um, each of like deep learning in the operating room and ethical considerations in this very specific niche like can in one sense be considered to be somewhat niche and specific, um, but the hope is that a lot of the concepts kind of generalize outside of like specifically, you know, surgery or specifically healthcare and indeed kind of might transmit to other, um, other disciplines, other domains as well. Hence the allegory of the OR. Um, and then thereafter, um, try to have uh, some time for some self-critical self-reflection for our community. Uh, so, um, you know, healthcare is like a gigantic beast um, uh, with many moving or somewhat moving parts inside. Um, and uh, it's been in sort of a, a bit of a rut or there's a certain degree of inertia that um, has to be overcome when we want to do new things, um, which might be even more severe than in other disciplines. Um, and, you know, we've lived with a lot of facts in healthcare for quite a while. Um, that didn't seem to have any clear resolution. So, so among these are just the fact that human beings make up so many of the gears of the healthcare system. And, you know, humans are just notoriously bad with information. And we often just sort of like ignore that fact when we're, when we're kind of making new decisions for, for healthcare. Um, so some of the ways that humans are bad with information include like um, the fact that patients misread or miscommunicate their own symptoms. Um, and that nearly half of American adults, according to like a, a somewhat older study from 2004, but hasn't really been supplanted, um, about half of American adults have difficulty understanding and acting upon health information given to them. So this is commonly seen, for example, when uh, a patient is, is prescribed, you know, a, a certain number of, of pills um, to take uh, for a condition, they take a few, they start feeling better, and then they think to themselves, well, I feel better, whatever the symptoms I had before are mostly gone. I don't appreciate these, these adverse uh, side effects. So I'll just stop the medication treatment halfway through the, the, uh, the course, um, which can lead to relapse and so on. Um, we're also, we have pretty bad memory. Our skills go obsolete. We have various kinds of cognitive biases. We have cognitive and time limitations, um, recency biases, 
Uh, so recency bias, for example, is, 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 you know, there's some studies that show that diagnoses actually correlate very strongly with advertising or media exposure. So even, even well-trained doctors, if they're exposed to a certain idea um, or a certain um, like adverse event or certain drugs in advertising or the media, they, they tend to like, um, there's, a, there's a strong positive correlation with their behaviors thereafter. Um, so yeah, humans are bad with, with information. And then how does this actually manifest? Well, Winters et al. has this paper from 2012 um, that suggested that almost 41,000 patients die just in the ICU and just in the United States every single year um, just due to misdiagnosis. Um, and misdiagnosis is an umbrella term, but these are still pretty stark statistics. That's sometimes been uh, described as you know, a, a plane full of people um, going down every single day. Um, and if we consider it in those terms, um, you know, this is clearly something that we ought to have some political will behind changing. Um, so just, just to wrap up this kind of, um, uh, you know, disparaging against, against humans, um, you know, there's a study also from, from uh, the previous decade, Graeber et al. They studied how these diagnostic errors actually occur. Um, they focused on internists um, and they discovered that in about 74% of cases where there were diagnostic errors, um, there was also cognitive factors that contributed to them. So other factors included things like just miscommunication or misplacement, other system systemic or systematic things in the, in the process that broke down. But in, in, in basically three quarters of cases, people simply just made mistakes. Um, and the most common of these was premature closure. So there's a lot of these studies coming out that suggest that you know, it's often the human beings in the system that contribute somewhat to the inefficiencies of this system. Oh, I should, I should ask, I should point out also, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but if there are any questions, I think you can, you can post them and, um, and then yes. Jillian can, can ask me. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I mentioned that, yeah, I, I'm happy to take a break because I've been, I've been speaking basically all day. <laughs> um, anyway, just to wrap this up, there's a paper which is, which is very old now. Um, many of you might've been born after this paper actually came out, but uh, again, just as other ones, this hasn't really been supplanted either um, or, or um, uh, disproven. Um, Eddie in 1990, they did a, a study with, with some of the top surgeons that they could find. They, had give, uh, they gave descriptions of surgical problems to these surgeons, and then they simply asked you know, to these individuals, should this patient have surgery? And what the paper found was that like in 50% of the cases, uh, on average, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the expectation was 50% of the time, the answer was yes, 50% of the time, the answer is no. Um, and then um, people like Vinod Kosla and others, have pointed out that this is really no better than just flipping a coin. So why invest all this time in educating, um, you know, surgeons and giving them fancy offices um, if you get the same results by just flipping a coin? At least when it comes to uh, clinical decisions. Uh, and then, moreover, the same paper, you know, give the same exact uh, cases to the same exact surgeons and ask them the same exact question. Uh, and then, almost half of the time, the surgeons change their change their mind, um, which is which is a very problematic uh, uh, coin indeed. Um, so there we are, um, well known that there was a problem with, with humans in the system. Now, along comes Jeff Hinton, um, you know, over the course of the last 20 years, but let's say, especially for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And he had, he had this quote um, to a talk, which I believe was in Toronto, um, um, which said, you know, um, that we have all these great new um, advances in deep learning, we're solving all these kinds of problems in all these different areas. And, you know, um, we're starting to think about the disruption of work. Um, now, is, is deep learning coming for the jobs of doctors? Um, and uh, here's this quote, I'll just read it. Um, I think that if you work as a radiologist, he said, you are like Wile E. Coyote in the cartoon. You're already over the edge of the cliff, but you haven't yet looked down. And it's completely obvious that in five years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists. And then he said it might be 10 years. Um, so I like this quote for many reasons, like one of which is that it kind of encapsulates the, um, the optimism in the deep learning community um, about all the great things that, that deep learning will be able to accomplish in, in our lifetimes. Um, on the other side of the coin, it's also, I mean, I think it was about four years ago that this, this quote was made. Um, and most radiologists that I know still have, have their jobs, um, although many of them are trying to get more um, uh, involved in, in machine learning projects and trying to educate themselves in programming, data science, and that sort of thing. Um, so there's an awful lot of opportunity um, in deep learning in healthcare. At least that's the um, expectation. But there's also this fact that you know we don't know if it's going to be five years, maybe ten years. 
um, even the most optimistic of us might think it could be 15 or 20 years. So there's also a lot of uncertainty. Um, now, despite the um, uncertainty, there's still a lot of hype around deep learning, in, including in, in healthcare. Um, and you know, it filtered out into the general public. And because um, we had this you know, notion of self-driving cars, um, you know, people were asking questions about healthcare. And then you had these articles like this popping up about artificial intelligence telling doctors how to do their jobs and wired. Um, you know, prepare yourselves, robots will soon replace doctors in healthcare in Forbes. And there's just this general consensus uh, in the in the public sphere that that you know um, people who work on AI are trying to replace um, radiologists and others with Pepper robot, like the one they have shown here, which isn't exactly the case. Um, often, what comes up in these sorts of discussions is this image, which I don't much care for. Um, like, there's always a picture of the Terminator when the media is trying to scare people about the future of AI. Um, uh, in this case, the headline is that robots are going to destroy jobs in our economy and maybe the world. Um, and uh, it's a pretty grim picture that's being painted. Um, now, um, I think there's a lot of cause for concern. And some of the cause for concern also is um, has to do with the future of work, including in healthcare. Like, there's no getting around that. But I don't really think that this is the most horrifying image of what the future of deep learning healthcare will look like. I think that this is a much more horrifying image of the future of deep learning and healthcare. Um, you know, people sitting at home, casually interacting with AI in the form of Siri or Alexa or other consumer electronics. Um, and for these consumer electronics to embed um, uh, simple, you know, machine learning algorithms that are meant to, um, uh, you know, track you know, mood, depression, anxiety, well-being, maybe symptoms. Um, maybe somebody was, was um, discharged from a hospital after just 24 hours of, uh, of a surgery and they're meant to check in with, with their app or something with regards to their symptoms uh, on their own um, through a system like this. So um, I think this is more problematic. Uh, I think it's a ton of promise in the, in the idea that we can do healthcare remotely, um, do more like remote care, but um, there's also a lot of peril, which I'm gonna just go over very briefly in a moment. Um, I should point out that I'm, I'm part of the problem. We have a project at the University of Toronto called Talk To Me. Um, which basically, you know, is a phone service and a web-based service that people can call up and then they answer questions. They do a couple of tasks like, um, like repeat after me kind of tasks or, um, you know, name all the kinds of birds you can think of in under a minute, that kind of thing. Uh, we, have, we have almost a thousand, you know, uh, people signed up for the service right now and we kind of track their various kind of cognitive um, aspects of, you know, their use of syntax, of meaning, executive function, that sort of thing. Um, and, and this is the kind of work that also spawned the uh, Winterlight company I mentioned before, which is trying to commercialize this sort of work with, with like pharma companies um, uh, with regards to depression, anxiety, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I, so I truly believe that uh, there's a lot can be done in this, in this area, but there's also a lot of room for skepticism. Um, now, the reason why, one of the reasons why I think um, this is the future of, of deep learning in healthcare is because of graphs like these. Um, so these graphs are about 10 years old, but the funding situations haven't changed too differently in Ontario and the United States with regards to where healthcare dollars are, are, are being spent. Um, so even in relatively different systems like, like uh, you know, single payer systems like Ontario or non-single payer systems like the United States, you know, we see kind of common trends about, you know, there's an awful lot of like about a third of, of costs go into physical hospitals where people have to have to travel and stay and you know about 20 to 25 percent is spent on physicians um, who are being overworked and are being asked to do a lot of the kind of menial kind of work with with charting and otherwise that they didn't necessarily sign up for um, now if we can use ai to alleviate some of the uh, costs associated with bringing people into hospitals and putting them in beds and feeding them um, while they're recuperating from say a surgery or if we can offload some of the tasks that physicians are currently using um, or working on and free up their time to do more patient interaction, to do more of the kind of work that they really care about. Um, I think this is where AI is gonna be going. And you know, there's a political push generally and Premier Kathleen Wynne's not a current Premier um, anymore, um, but um, you know, near the end of her, her administration or her government, there was this idea that we wanna move from more of a hospital centered system towards more of a community uh, system with more primary care also. So I think with um, organizations like, um, like OTN, 
uh, Ontario Telemedicine Network, we're going to be seeing more technologies being pushed out to the edge, including those that involve people using using apps and others other kind of remote monitoring systems to monitor various kinds of uh, conditions. So, um, you know, I mentioned that um, we could. Sorry, somebody can turn off their. I think it's Matt. Do you mind turning off your microphone? Thanks. Um, um, so yeah, one of the things that Winterlay does and what we do with Talk To Me is we kind of assess for people um, for anxiety and depression by listening for subtle signs in their voice that might indicate you know, a change in their mood or a change in their cognitive function like on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. Um, this is kind of an old idea. Um, and at uh, USC about 10 years ago, there was this project called SimCoach which had kind of a similar idea of you know, the fact that we didn't, we didn't have enough you know, care workers that could individually visit um, in that case, a lot of um, like VAs, veterans from the military in the United States, they couldn't, you know, personally contact them, um, work with them through issues like PTSD and depression and other, other mental health issues. So they came up with this kind of online system where there, there's this kind of avatar in a nice picturesque uh, arboreal setting. Um, and it it's kind of does the old Eliza chatbot kind of thing of kind of just asking you questions and asking you to express yourself. Um, and um, I think this actually was a, was a pretty decent um, project. You know, it, it, it wasn't meant to completely replace human interaction, but in those you know, times between when a nurse or a care worker could visit somebody, at least there was an outlet by which somebody could express themselves. And that's often all it takes to kind of alleviate some of the, uh, some of the symptoms, at least temporarily. Um, now that sounds good, but um, you know, I, I think often in machine learning, we see like a, a new kind of application like this one, and um, we can measure off some positive effects like the ones I just mentioned. Um, and sometimes this makes it, its way into the media or the public discussion, or at least the high level discussion of our various departments. And all we hear is like the good news of, of deep learning, um, but it's not always the case. So um, here's you know, how Siri dealt with, with um, issues related to PTSD um, and depression not too long ago. So if you were to say something like, remind me to kill myself tomorrow to Siri, uh, not too long ago, um, you know, she would say, sure, I'll remind you tomorrow to kill yourself. Um, or if you said, I'm going to jump off a bridge and die, uh, Siri would, would, would find some bridges for you uh, to do that. And in fact, she'd even rank them by um, which ones are closest, so you don't have to walk too far. Um, so, I mean, the reason this is happening is because, you know, um, Siri technically is AI in the sense that she's meant to mimic a human in some form. She interacts with you through speech and language. Um, she's not really machine learning, so she didn't learn that a good response to this kind of prompt is this kind of reminder. Um, but, um, you know, there's a bit of code uh, that someone wrote in Cupertino that says, well, look, whenever somebody says anything that begins with remind me to, um, just open the reminders app and put whatever they said into the reminders app. And that's going to that's gonna be the solution 95% of the time. But they didn't consider corner cases such as these. Um, anyway, so you know this uh, and similar kind of responses that occurred on other platforms made its way into the media, um, like so often happens. And then Siri had to, and Apple had to respond. So now, if you say to uh, Siri something that might indicate something along that lines of self harm, like I'm thinking of killing myself, now there's another snippet of code that another engineer at Apple um, wrote that identifies this and says, well, if you're thinking about suicide, um, you may want to speak with someone at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. They're at this number and I can call them for you, which is a fantastic response to this kind of prompt. Um, but it's still AI and you know maybe um, they didn't wanna pay this engineer overtime. So that's where the conversation ends. So if you'd say to Siri, no, I'm just gonna kill myself. There's nothing, in, <laughs> there's nothing that she can do at that point. She says, okay. Um, so there's clearly a lot of work to be done on AI in the public realm, um, which I think still includes the kind of remote monitoring applications we were talking about a moment ago. Now again, uh, Siri is artificial intelligence in some form, but it's not really machine learning. Siri doesn't learn how to have a conversation. She just does, you know, to some extent what someone at, at Apple told her to do. Um, but machine learning is not necessarily that much um, less fragile. So I wanna talk about this paper. Um, this is another old, uh, old hit. It's kind of the canonical paper in, um, in machine learning in healthcare. Um, from 2017, some uh, researchers uh, from Stanford um, and other places 
uh, wanted to see if they could identify uh, malignant uh, skin um, lesions or tumors from, from benign ones. Um, so they had a lot of images. Well, they had relatively a lot of images, 130,000 clinical images, benign and malignant uh, lesions and tumors. Um, and you know, to the untrained eye, they looked fairly similar to one another. And they also had sort of the clinical taxonomy, um, which is shown here on the left. You know, there's skin diseases of various types. Some of them are benign and the benign ones break down into like dermal benign skin diseases, epidermal benign skin diseases and, and so on. So we had sort of like a background knowledge that we could kind of frame this problem uh, in. Um, so one of the first kind of results of this paper was another kind of encouraging positive thing um, was that if you just train a neural network to just on the signal of here are the malignant images, here are the benign ones, um, and give it no other real signal, and then you kind of open up the neural network and you try to infer a little bit about what the neural network is actually learning, you can get an image like this. I believe this is just a Tisney image. Um, and then, you know, they've, they've highlighted it themselves with, with nevi, uh, basal cell carcinomas, uh, melanomas. So they've labeled each of these data points uh, according to the taxonomy that we know exist, existed. And then they were very happy with themselves because they found that a lot of these uh, taxonomically different skin lesions also kind of clustered in different areas of the space. And they said, well, you know, um, the neural network without having to be told anything about that taxonomy that we had to you know, drill into medical students and kind of, um, you know, induce ourselves um, uh, over the years, you know, the neural network can learn a taxonomy all on its own simply from a, a relatively simple binary signal, which is great. And then they did the thing that all machine learning people did was they just wanted to show how accurate the system was. Um, so these graphs show uh, sensitivity versus specific, specificity of their system in blue. Uh, and then they compared this against 21 of the best certified dermatologists they could find. These are the red dots here. And then the end result is that while well, this blue curve um, is more sensitive and more specific uh, than 20 of, of 21 of those 21 dermatologists. And that was a nice nail in the coffin or a nice bow on the package of this paper. Um, look, look what great things we can do with deep learning. Uh, we can we can supplant the best humans, just like we talked about in one of the earlier slides where we had like the um, surgeons who are no better than flipping a coin. Look, look at all these good things that technologies can do that, that humans are, are unable to do. So it kind of is nice, it fits with that narrative pretty nicely. Now, well, one thing I wanted to mention is that um, shortly after this paper came out, uh, two papers came out in different venues that kind of raised a couple of criticisms. Uh, one of which was the fact that this um, paper was, uh, or, or this, this model was trained with mostly light-skinned people. Um, and one paper didn't really do any empirical follow-up, the other paper did. Um, and the idea generally is that, well, you know, if you train a system with a lot of white people um, to detect, you know, uh, malign, uh, malignant from benign lesions, it's not going to work as well for people with darker skin. And indeed, that was the, the case as shown in that second paper. Um, it just didn't work well enough for, for uh, other groups. It doesn't mean that their overall architecture was faulty, but the beyond the architecture, the empirical process that was used to train it um, didn't factor in you know, um, uh, demographic differences. So the, the system itself, um, even though it was mostly just a prototype for the purposes of this paper, um, you know, more needed to be done before it could be actually deployed in practice. So we're talking about this paper because I wanted to highlight you know, some of the issues with machine learning and the fragility of machine learning. Like obviously artificial intelligence can break down, can break down um, as in the case of Surrey, it's one of the reasons why we turned to, to machine learning in the first place. Uh, but machine learning is not perfect. Um, so here's another great paper. Um, uh, deep neural networks are easily fooled, right? I think a lot of you have seen this already. Um, and what this paper showed was that you could take um, a, uh, a group of images and you could take um, a model that was trained to um, classify these images or categorize the contents of these images with extreme accuracy, like just like we saw in the previous slide where we're, we're beating all humans and we're getting 95% sensitivity, specificity, and so on. Great models and standard data. What you can do is you can train a second neural network um, or any other kind of generative model to produce um, uh, these other images shown in these center columns. Uh, and then if you can add just like, you know, 1% or a fraction of a percent of these confounder images to these first images, um, you can make that fancy neural network um, see whatever we want it to see. Um, so maybe, you know, it was in the first case, you know, 95% accuracy, 
um, it would recognize this as a school bus and this as anger watt, I think, and this as a stick bug, I think, and this is a cute puppy or as a puppy. Um, um, but then we add a bit of this, this confounder image and suddenly a school bus becomes an ostrich and anger watt becomes an ostrich and this puppy becomes an ostrich as well. Um, so that um, was kind of a contrived empirical case. Like they really wanted to confuse that neural network in the first place, but you know, Around 2015, that was the, around the time when deep learning uh, and all its capacities was really kind of hitting a fever pitch and the hype cycle, which we're probably still in, um, was still expanding um, very rapidly. And I think this was a good, you know, um, bit of context to suggest that, you know, there's more to these models that meets the eye and we have to be careful. So this is where I wanna talk a little bit about the risks of artificial intelligence. So generally, you know, there's, there's this risk that AI in the wrong hands um, or the hands of people we consider to be the wrong hands um, or in the hands of a select flu, a few, um, this AI might perform tasks that might not be globally optimal. Um, and it also might change the nature of work in unexpected or adverse ways. Obviously there's like a couple of governments um, in the world that are using AI um, for say state surveillance and we in Canada um, generally don't view that as a positive use of, of this kind of technology. Um, and even if there's certain companies um, that we generally admire, there's also the fact that, you know, and even if you admire Elon Musk um, or uh, Jeff Bezos, um, you know, there's still something to be said against um, the idea that those two individuals or maybe three or four others should, should have the kind of control they have over the current and future um, use of AI generally. But regardless, I, th I think personally, um, an even bigger risk is that AI in the right hands will also um, fail. And I think this is a bigger risk because um, even, you know, we have people who might be doing things for the right reasons and they might be following very careful empirical procedures. Uh, they're, they're being as, as good a scientist as they possibly can try to be. They wanna open source their models and they're doing things as, as well as they can. Um, but sometimes, you know, because of our, our blind spots, we might um, not see the kinds of errors or the kinds of risks that we just were exposed in that paper from the previous slide. Uh, and therefore, we have the assumption that everything is just is fine when in fact, of course, it isn't. Um, so like, you know, this might be the case where we might be given goals that are too abstract. So typically, you know, the kinds of um, control functions we, we give, the kind of loss functions we give when we're training neural networks are not to too dissimilar from just you know minimize error or maximize the probability of the training data you know, according to the parameters of your model. Like those those are really simple abstract um, loss functions that that don't cover enough corner cases or cover enough as aspects of how the system might be used in practice to really um, uh, capture the danger of these systems. Uh, so in particular, you know, if you just simply tell a, a model to be as accurate as possible, to minimize error to the maximum extent possible, it might just find some trick to achieve those goals that we don't necessarily understand. Maybe we're not even capable of understanding. And then the model will end up having kind of unexpected or behavior that we just can't uh, interpret. Um, so these are, are naturally uh, risks. There's another paper that, that comes up a bunch. Um, um, uh, concrete Problems in AI Safety, written by people at um, OpenAI and Google and, and other places. Um, and I like this paper um, for a couple of reasons. It's a nice kind of middle ground between computer scientists and outside of computer science, um, you know, to discuss. It, it, it covers a lot of topics that are going to be relevant to us in computer science, science and for people outside of computer science. Um, there's no equations or algorithms or anything. Um, and it breaks down some of the problems of AI um, into these kind of five categories. Um, we wanna avoid negative side effects. We wanna avoid the issue of reward hacking, which is similar to the one I mentioned a moment ago. You know, if you just give um, a model a very abstract, simple reward, um, the training process can find a way to maximize this reward by these shortcuts that you know um, we may not really appreciate. Um, we wanna be able to you know, when the systems are used at a scale that is beyond uh, our capacity uh, for human work, how do we maintain oversight of these systems? Um, ensuring robustness to distributional shift is, is kind of a very common low level problem we, we encounter in, in machine learning. Like how, how do we, like there's, there's a bunch of different conceptions of distributional shift, but generally like how do we make sure that a model um, trained at one time 
is still going to be useful at some future time, as well as being used in different contexts. Like a, is a model trained in Toronto, is it going to be similarly useful um, in, in the Yukon? Um, and then in the case of like reinforcement learning, where you have agents that actually operate in the real world that have to actually do a little bit of, of suboptimal um, actions in order to learn a more robust model, how do we allow that to happen uh, in a way that is, is as safe as possible? So how do we balance the safety of these suboptimal actions with the fact that we need to do these suboptimal actions in the first place? I just want to dig a little bit deeper into some of these topics that this paper brought up. Um, to avoid negative side effects, they, they introduced the idea of including this impact regularizer um, that just basically penalizes change to the environment. Um, but then it also raises the question about how, well, how do we actually represent change to the environment uh, in a system that can only really um, understand the um, environment in kind of uh, stochastic or uncertain terms. Um, this paper also suggests that we might be uh, willing to penalize the influence. So maybe when we're thinking of deploying an AI system, we want to simply make sure that we're limiting the amount of, of uh, and scope of resources available to it. Um, so if you're thinking of deploying a clinical decision support system in a healthcare setting, for example, um, maybe we don't want to give that system um, unfettered access to like all of the resource allocations in a hospital. So it, it would like allocate beds, for example, on its own. We, we, just, we wouldn't allow them to do that. There need to be a human in the loop to make that kind of decision. Um, now, I mean, this is a bit sci-fi, but the paper also talks about how would a system represent uh, empowerment. This, this kind of concept comes up occasionally in the core computer science literature, but kind of rarely. Um, normally, you know, the human designers of these systems represent empowerment ourselves when we're de designing the system. Um, and then it also raises some questions, like do we penalize the AI system if it merely can take an action or if it actually does take an action? Again, normally this is the kind of question that can be resolved when we're designing the system in the first place, but it's still something we need to consider. Uh, reward hacking is always like a, a really interesting topic uh, for me um, because of the fact that like, you know, we can produce pretty uh, complicated loss functions um, that are maybe a combination of a lot of, you know, subcomponents. Maybe we're not just trying to minimize error, but we're also trying to, um, you know, um, uh, maximize fairness according to some formulation, which I'll we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but regardless of however we design our um, loss functions, there's always the kind of risk that the trading process, by its very nature of trying to optimize its reward, will still find some way of, of finding a solution that uh, finds some shortcut that really um, avoids learning anything uh, about the phenomenon. And instead of just learn something about the nature of the data set it's given. Um, so, um, you know, uh, abstract rewards is an issue that comes up in this paper. Um, when we have um, this so-called curse of dimensionality, when we have data that is represented in, in hundreds of thousands or millions of parameters, and we have models that have hundreds of millions or billions of, of parameters, um, you know, having these very abstract rewards is a very easy way, a very good way of, of producing um, these shortcuts that we don't like. Um, there's also something called Goodhart's Law, which comes up in the paper which basically boils down to the idea that when a metric is used as a target, it is no longer a good metric. Um, this is something that kind of wraps up in the paper, but it doesn't often come up uh, in the context of actually designing these systems, at least not for any research purposes. So an example of Goodhart's law in practice might be this kind of logic. If I increase the number of prescriptions I give, then patient admissions uh, decreases and therefore I should maximize prescriptions. Because maybe you know the patient admissions is a metric that uh, matters to me, um, and uh, the increase in prescriptions is strongly negatively correlated to uh, admissions. Um, but this is problematic for various reasons. One of which is we don't really know what the relationship is between prescriptions and admissions when it comes to um, like the latent relationship or a causal relationship. Um, and certainly some, some of these things might be better used as, as metrics and some as targets. Uh, and finally, um, this paper talks about, um, well, you know, scalability, you know, if we have a model trained only on a few examples, it might not scale well. This came up with a paper on dermatology before, 130,000 images uh, can be a lot for uh, computer vision applied to very specific um, medical contexts. Um, but even in that very narrow case, it didn't even generalize to people whose um, skin was, was a bit darker than, than the typical German they had in their data set. Um, 
similarly, a lot of the models and the way we train them is meant to kind of be the best system on average, which is not too dissimilar from the idea of regressing to the, the mean, which can sometimes mean that we kind of almost implicitly uh, choose to ignore cases which are kind of um, out of distribution or outliers, uh, and therefore um, rare uh, events or even unseen events, which are probably going to be rare in the population, um, just aren't going to be captured very well. And in fact, you know, in order to achieve those very high accuracies on the average, we end up really um, um, decimating the performance on, on those, those rare cases. Um, one solution, which I believe comes up in this paper, is active learning. So active learning is a sub-area of machine learning in which you know, we have a ton of data, too few humans to annotate all of that data. Um, so we might only have 10% of the data being annotated initially. Um, we train a model on that 10% and then we use the model itself to ask the humans um, to annotate a specific set of uh, the rest of the data. So the model might be um, very, like looking at all the unlabeled data, it might be very confused as to what label to apply to like the next 10% and say, well, here's the 10% the of the remaining data that I have the most trouble with, um, you know, please annotate these. Um, and trouble can basically be something like the uniformity of the probability distribution over its output classes, something simple like that. Um, so this may help, but um, a lot of the papers that um, try to employ active learning are not too dissimilar from the kind of theme I'm trying to um, um, bring up uh, here in that they'll have a couple of wins and a couple of cases where active learning will show that you can get as good performance on only 40 or 50% of the data being annotated as you do on the full 100%. So if only you would use active learning, um, you could save a lot of analysts time um, and annotation time by only really having to annotate half of your data. Um, and similarly, you know, if you're deploying a system um, and you have new data constantly coming in, um, if a model says this data is very different from the kind of data that I was trained on, um, you know, having humans in the loop to continuously uh, provide their consensus and their input validate the more difficult data is something which um, is meant to deal with, with um, both scalable oversight. So we don't have to look at all the data, just some of it. And it can also deal with, with changes in the distribution as it's deployed to new environments. Um, the paper talks about a model acknowledging its own ignorance. Uh, this is another kind of more of a sci-fi kind of way of putting it. Um, usually the model doesn't explicitly say I'm ignorant of this specific uh, explicit fact but instead it'll reveal its ignorance through like its entropy or something over its decisions, um, which we use in the process like active learning. Um, and then we can just, you know, resist shifting its parameters. So if you're doing this thing where you have a pre-trained model and you're, you're kind of continuously adapting the parameters of this model as new data come in through standard transfer learning or, or retraining, um, you can, you can you know, narrow the speed at which um, the model changes its parameters. It's, tons of ways to do that that go back many decades. I want to throw out that one method that I particularly like is something called canary deployment. Um, so um, uh, I mentioned this normally to people who are doing AI in production like I am, but there's a system called Kubeflow, which is built on top of another system called Kubernetes, which is a, a brilliant way of kind of deploying and scaling AI, um, you know, arbitrarily. Um, and it, it basically kind of connects to safe exploration in the sense that, and, and Google uses this too, like you might have a, a big model in which you're very confident providing responses to say search queries uh, or giving you labels on, on bits of data. Um, but then you might have a new model that maybe incorporates some of the new data that trickled in since you deployed that first model. And the canary deployment kind of stochastically uh, decides when new data comes in, you know, if this, if this new data does not seem to be particularly problematic or very risky, we could associate, we could give it to the good old tried and tested model, or we can give it to this new model that presumably is even better, but hasn't really been tested out yet. And then you can give it to both or either one, and then you can, you can judge how the system performs in either deployment. And, um, and then once this new model is shown to like be as consistent and, and performant as the old one, then we, we swap the old tried and true model for this new, this new one. So this is something that we're using in, in practice in our, in our own deployments of AI in healthcare. So again, just to wrap up the discussion of, of this sort of conception of different ways in which AI can break down, different problems in AI safety and ways we can resolve them. You know, we talked about negative side effects. We talked a little bit about reward hacking, distributional shift. 
Um, but there's one thing that doesn't actually occur in this paper, but I think is just as important. And that's the fact that we really need to make sure that these decisions are explainable, right? Um, um, you know, me and my students have been developing uh, machine learning and healthcare for um, quite a while. Um, and, um, you know, when we think we have a solution, when we think we have a system that performs very well, and we put it in front of clinicians and say, what do you think of this? Do you think this is something that you could use in your practice? Um, normally, like, there's, there's resistance to the idea that, well, there's this black box um, that this takes in data and then, you know, a red light goes on if the person has Alzheimer's or if they have cancer and a green light goes on if the model thinks they don't. Like, it, it doesn't really help them in terms of their, their practice. And really what they wanted was some understanding of what the model is doing. And without a better understanding of the model, they simply don't want to use it. So it's a problem of AI in cultural terms. Like if we want to actually deploy AI, we need to be aware of the context in which the deployment actually is going to be occurring. So I want to dig into a little bit to explainable AI now. Um, so I think we want machine learning to be explainable for many reasons. Um, we want to be able to identify and remove bias to promote safety. So we want to be able to open up that black box and see, does it perform just as well on, on darker skin as it does on lighter skin, for example. Um, sometimes we want to be able to leverage domain expertise and induce new knowledge. So by that, I mean, um, you know, we had a system where that was meant to detect Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and then we were able to say, well, you know, there's a couple of features of speech and language that are very predictive of, of dementia. Um, and these include things like pausing before complicated words or using simpler words as opposed to more complicated ones or using simpler grammars. Um, and if you express decisions in those terms, then the domain experts, the neurologists and the gerontologists and the speech language pathologists would kind of say, okay, good. This model is learning something that kind of fits with my understanding of, of neurodegeneration for this disease. Um, and in some cases um, we might be able to induce new knowledge. So if some of the clinical descriptions of dementia might not have included, like say the, uh, your affect or the pitch of your voice, but if the model is very confident that, um, you know, there's a very small variance in the pitch of your voice, for people with more advanced stages of dementia, this might be something new that uh, if it's interpretable could maybe inform future practice. So there's kind of a nice uh, feedback loop. Um, also, you know, we want things to be explainable because we want to make sure we can generalize them and, can, and make sure these models are consistent. So this is not too dis dissimilar from the idea of distributional shift I was talking about a moment ago. Um, again, you know, we might have a lot of data recorded in Toronto in a fancy operating room with fancy equipment. Um, but, you know, we want to be able to understand if a model trained in that environment is really just tracking um, the movements of individuals within that environment that would generalize to people in a, a like a smaller environment with a smaller number of people, say in, in a Callowit or, or um, Yellowknife or something. Um, so we need to understand what, what's the model actually learning? Is it learning something that generalizes outside of the core contexts? And of course, we want to be able to audit and trust the system, which actually is not just a want, it's actually also a need. So I'll talk about this in a moment, but there's more indications that um, explainable AI is gonna be um, the requirement for actually deploying AI in healthcare in places like the United States and Europe. Um, so I'll talk about that in a few moments. Now, explainable AI uh, is also a sub area of, of AI and mostly machine learning. Um, and it, it seemed to sprout up around the time of that paper uh, neural networks are easily fooled and around this idea that, yeah, there's some, some issues here with regards to these black boxes we're training that we need to understand. So I'm not sure if explainable AI, you know, spread it up as a consequence, but it uh, happened around the same time. But even still, even after about four or five years of this area really having its own, you know, workshops and conferences, um, it's still a very new area. Um, this paper is a bit old now, but it kind of highlights the fact that we don't even have the right terminology in all cases uh, for explainable AI. So there's actually a figure in this paper that shows that, you know, sometimes people talk about explainable AI and sometimes people talk about interpretable AI, and it really depends on who's talking and to whom they're talking. Um, and in fact, if you look at like workshops in this area, you might have N papers and you might have N plus one different mechanisms people are using to try to make AI, AI more interpretable. So there's, there's no kind of really core um, set of data or a core um, like, like ImageNet, for example, in, in computer vision, or like a core like de facto baseline that everybody uses like, like 3D CNNs, again, in computer vision. Um, that said, there are things that are approaching baselines. So this um, line is something like a baseline um, that people sometimes use when they're talking about explainable AI. Um, so this paper has this kind of cartoon description of what Lyme is actually doing. 
Um, the idea is that these modern methods are learning these very complicated nonlinear decision boundaries, say, between two categories uh, here projected down into just two dimensions that are kind of hard for us to kind of conceptualize what does this shape really mean. Um, but what it does is, well, if we're trying to explain why this big red plus is actually a red plus and not a blue circle, what we do is we kind of find um, a linear decision um, like hyperplane or line um, between, you know, the red pluses and the blue circles. Um, so, you know, hyperplanes, straight lines are things that humans are comfortable um, with understanding. And we have a couple of examples on either side. Look, everything on this side of the hyperplane is red pluses. Everything on that side of the hyperplanes is um, blue circles. And look, we're on this side of the hyperplane. Therefore, it's a, it's a red plus. And that's generally how this kind of baseline works. Um, this method is, is one that we use ourselves um, in surgical safety, um, which I, I kind of like. It's, it's one of a whole class of explainable AI methods that kind of results in heat maps um, or tries to understand like relevance of data and decisions. And in fact, it expl explicitly tries to map these together. So like here on the top is like a standard feed forward neural network, um, cartoonified. Um, so we have all the pixels of an image being arrayed on the input layer, passed through multiple layers, and then a decision pops out on the other side. So this entire network um, can be thought of as a function of x. So x is an image, and the function of x is a decision that the network makes. There's something called a first order Taylor decomposition, which can represent uh, functions, arbitrary functions, um, in this way. The details don't matter so much, except that it includes this um, differential, the differential of a function with regards to some subpart x sub p of the function. Um, and so uh, Montavon et al. kind of took this and applied it to a neural network specifically. And they had the notion of the, the relevance of each of the neurons within a neural network to an ultimate decision. And again, it was represented by these differentials. So you could kind of pass um, relevance of a decision back through a network. So you had these two networks, one trained to make a decision and this one kind of trained to identify like relevance or track relevance. So once a decision was made, you can look at the previous um, layer and say, well, what, like, which neurons in the previous layer were most relevant to my decision? And you can back propagate this all the way to the level of the inputs, which again are at the level of pixels. And then therefore you get kind of a heat map over um, all of the pixels in the original image, which can tell you why, um, like which pixels were the most relevant to a decision. So like in this paper, again, um, we use this method and they classified images into different species of animal. And you can see like, you know, um, why is this a cat? Well, it's a cat because of these pixels around the ears or why is this a hammerhead shark? It's a hammerhead shark, you know, especially because of the, um, the dorsal fin, but a little bit of because of its shape of its head and so on. And then you can present this kind of images to people who have to say find cancer um, in, in CT scans. Why is this cancer? Well, it's cancer because of these, this area of the lung or whatever. And then a human can, can understand that decision. Um, not perfect by any means. Um, so there's a lot of controversy in this very young field about um, these kinds of methods in particular. Um, some papers have shown that even minor modifications to the inputs can result in very different uh, explanations. And we don't want that to happen. Like if an image is rotated only slightly, or if we add a little bit of noise to an image, we fundamentally want to get the same kind of explanation for um, the categorization of that image. Um, but that doesn't some, seem to be the case. So there's still a lot of room for improvement, but that you know, just because there's room for improvement doesn't mean that these methods should be just tossed out. We don't want to toss out the baby with the bathwater as the expression goes. So um, those are kind of some methods that people are using to do explainable AI. Um, but I mentioned that we might have to do explainable AI. So this is kind of what I was talking about. Um, this is a letter from the FDA's lawyers to Apple's lawyers um, with regards to the classification of the Apple Watch or one of the Apple Watches as a class two medical device. Um, so up until recently, there was like no um, class one or class two um, medical device that really was built upon AI. And then around late 2018 and increasing since then, more and more devices have been approved um, for use um, uh, that have AI under the hood. And I bring this up in particular because on the second page of this letter, they have a couple of controls. So these are things that Apple needs to uh, maintain in order to keep on selling the Apple Watch as a class two medical device. And they touch on some things that I really care a lot about, um, especially in my, my former and somewhat current role um, with the International Standards Organization. Like there needs to be ways that we can, you know, verify the software and validate it using, using um, uh, previously adjudicated data sets. We need to 
you know, not just have a single set of data and fill in a table and write a paper about it, but there's controls for, for empirical um, tests. But they also mention, um, you know, that human factors have to be uh, part of the controls. And one of them is that the user must be able to correctly interpret the device output and understand when to seek medical care. So, you know, this is lawyer speak, and this is pretty much it. Um, um, they don't go into much more technical detail than this, but I mean, maybe I'm biased, but when I see this, you know, when I talk, when I see even the word interpret coming in and the idea that uh, the user um, needs to be able to understand why the device produced a certain output, like uh, there's atrial fibrillation, um, that is explainable AI, in my opinion. Um, Across the pond, um, we have the GDPR. Uh, and the GDPR is based on a lot of legislation, uh, including this uh, data protection directive, which itself provides a right to an explanation in, in recital 71. Uh, and here's the text of that recital. Um, so this includes, this was basically built on decisions made by people um, on like electronic medical records uh, and other data that were being introduced at the time. Um, but it, it still has to generalize to systems that use AI for decision-making processes. And in this recital, they talk about the fact that the data subject has to have the right um, uh, to obtain an explanation of the decision um, at some point. So if AI is gonna be introduced um, under this um, right to an explanation under the data protection directive, um, which formed one of the foundations of the GDPR, um, you know, they need to be able to, to have some explanation for the decision, which again, uh, from my reading, I'm not a lawyer, but from my reading uh, touches on uh, explainable AI. So even though I'm not a lawyer, I know that recitals are not binding. So um, this recital is not like one of the binding um, uh, parts of the GDPR, um, but it still kind of indicates, you know, where these legislatures, legislators are, are thinking of going with regards to the use of data and software for healthcare. Um, so that being said, um, you know, I, I, I was suggesting that the, um, if you know, we're pretending that explainability will not be a part of AI in healthcare is gonna be naive. Um, you know, for the past five or six years, I've, I've been you know, putting AI into practice um, either through companies or through like QI initiatives. Uh, and in most of these cases, the clinicians aren't satisfied with like, you know, just a light that goes on saying the person has cancer or, or you know, this person has Alzheimer's, they need to have an explanation. So there's this kind of a cultural imperative um, and there's also, I'd, I'd hope, a imperative by, on the part of the manufacturers of these systems to avoid the kinds of risks that we are, you know, um, likely to see. Um, we should have AI be explainable in healthcare. Um, but, you know, even though there's also some controversy, like I mentioned a moment ago, um, and even though when we talk about explainable AI, we often have to discuss some of the problems of AI. Um, you know, including papers like the one I mentioned before and in others, you know, um, some people might not like the negative connotation, but I think, you know, we were scientists, we need to um, be reasonable. And if um, we are going to take the point of view that explainable AI should not be a part of healthcare uh, deployments is potentially um, dangerous. Uh, I want to just highlight this other paper um, uh, from 2017 that focuses specifically on some legal aspects of accountability of AI under the law. Uh, and they focus on explanation. It's a really great paper, which I won't have time to get into, but they talk about you know, impact, which is not too dissimilar from the kinds of topics that were uh, came up in the Amade paper on concrete problems in AI safety. Uh, they also talk about values a little bit um, you know, and kind of consequences. So what can happen uh, if an action was taken that was erroneous and the error was made by the machine? Um, how often do we expect error, um, you know, and where does responsibility lie if the inputs are unreliable um, or if the outcomes are not explainable um, and just also the kind of soft aspects of trust and system integrity. So these are all kind of topics that come up a bunch in this paper and they point, because it's an, mostly focused on American law, they talk a lot about precedent and they talk about uh, so-called strict liability, um, which is sort of the, um, uh, my understanding is generally how people um, how the law views decisions of, of groups of entities um, in terms of um, uh, culpability. And finally, I want to just mention that um, I kind of hinted at it a moment ago, but we're using explainable AI in our own systems. Um, this is a paper from uh, um, JAMA uh, Surgery um, where we talk about, um, we kind of do a post hoc analysis of a very simple explainable AI system in um, the uh, domain of uh, 
uh, anastomosis, sorry, not anastomosis, um, uh, anaphylaxis. So um, there's a system that can kind of predict if anaphylaxis or like a shortness of, of breath essentially, like the oxygenation goes down. The system could predict that five minutes before it was to occur. And there was a very simple linear model that can predict it and explain its decision in simple terms. Um, so this paper kind of talks about, well, that, that's it's, it's great, um, but there's human factors that also have to be considered if um, the system is gonna be making errors, say even 5% of the time or even 1% of the time, uh, to what extent would these warnings uh, and these very simple explanations actually cause more of um, uh, a distraction and therefore a harm than a good in practice. So this, this paper talks a little bit about um, aspects of machine learning, but also a little bit of, of human factors. Oops, sorry. I, um, I literally put a warning here to remind myself that the next slide contains something that looks like raw chicken. So if, you're, if you don't like the, uh, the idea that this is a person, just pretend this is raw chicken. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about surgery now and the OR black box. Uh, so the OR black box is one of the products that we produce um, in uh, surgical safety technologies. Um, it takes in um, various kinds of sensory information. There's video cameras installed around an operating room. Uh, there's endoscopic cameras and laparoscopic cameras that are inserted into the body during surgery. There's wearable technology, patient physiology, environmental factors, medical records, and other devices that all feed into the OR black box. Um, and then a combination of um, human analysts and AI um, assesses for things like risks and hazards, um, safety threats and resilience, assessing for surgical team performance um, and surgical technology and uh, assessment of efficiency. So for example, we might look at the instruments that a surgeon is using inside the body and their motion, and we could assess for things like how respectful is a surgeon of tissue, um, how fluid is their motion, how efficient is their motion, how well are they using their trainees to perform certain phases, how are those, those phases broken down. So AI is being used for all of these things in practice uh, in this product uh, with our, our um, partners and customers. Um, so I mentioned we also use these cameras on the wall, so we can, we, can, we can look over the shoulder of these surgeons and we can watch what they're doing and we can assess for things like, like inefficiency, so if an operating room is not being used for a certain length of time or if people aren't really um, um, doing anything um, or if a room is set up in a way that is somewhat inefficient, we can use this kind of external view of the operating room to, to identify that and AI can, can kind of track people and see how they're moving. Um, we can also you know, use the tracking of people to identify the causes of, of problems. So one canonical case involved a, a breach in sterility in which uh, a team member um, touched their hair um, uh, behind their head with their bare hand. Um, and it seemed to be the case that they did this while like uh, there was a distraction occurring across the operating room. Uh, so we, and then, you know, um, because this happened, they were distracted and then therefore this was basically an adverse event. Now, um, because we can do this, um, there's lots of ramifications for it. Um, the question usually comes up when people hear about the black box is like, are surgeons actually gonna want this to be running? Um, because even though there's evidence from like the Hawthorne effect that people perform better if they know they're being watched, um, you know, um, uh, people are worried about their careers and um, malpractice claims. And it is a fact that, you know, in any operation, there's gonna be um, very minor um, errors that are made. And sometimes there's, there's bleeding events that are happening. Sometimes they're planned. Sometimes they're not planned, but they're still very minor. But if we identify that so-and-so is responsible for it and a patient um, or an employer gets um, the data, um, this can be a, a, a problem for, for the team. So uh, we our solution to that is to um, de-identify the data. Hopefully this will just play on its own. I don't have to select it. Or I may not play at all because, let's see, there we go. So this shows kind of what we, we tried to do uh, to solve this problem of, of, um, of people being identified. So this is like a sim center, this is not a real surgery, but these are real surgeons and uh, anesthetists and so on. The AI can use pretty standard technology to identify people and provide us with the confidence um, in their decisions. This is, I'm 100% sure that this is a person, more than 97% sure that this is a person over here. Um, and then once this is done, we you know, completely block off the heads. 
we blur out the bodies um, and um, you know we just basically try to de-identify as much as we possibly can. We also de-identify the audio in a like an irreversible way. So this is normally enough to like achieve the baseline of HIPAA compliance. Um, so we can say that there's a reasonable doubt that one blurry image of somebody is actually a particular person. Um, but there's still other work that we have to be careful about. So AI is really good at identifying, you know, um, people and heads. Um, uh, but sometimes there's other kind of clues in the environment that a clever person can use to reconstruct the identity of somebody. So if you see a clock on the wall at a certain time, and if you know that the configuration of a room is say OR8 in your hospital, and you know that only Dr. So-and-so does uh, this particular surgery in this particular room, and you know that they were operating at that particular time, then you can de-identify them that way. So we're also trying to identify other aspects of the room too, um, but it's a continuous process for us. Um, now we had this paper about privacy versus AI in medicine in the University of Toronto Medical Journal. Um, in which we talk a little bit about the recital um, in GDPR that I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, we also mentioned this. Um, so the very same month that GDPR came into effect in, in, in Europe, uh, Canada issued some new guidance for uh, personal information and protections around it. Um, and they said in this um, new guidance that an organization can collect or disclose personal information only for purposes that a reasonable person would consider to be as appropriate under the circumstances. And we discussed a little bit about what this reasonable person, um, the clue they actually are, um, because uh, we don't know who this reasonable person is. I think um, uh, we all know each other well enough <laughs> um, that uh, there's always blind spots that we all have um, uh, about our understanding of data usage. And then I think in particular, the more people understand about how some of these systems work, the more concern we might have about um, like possible ways that they can break down. So whoever this reasonable person is in the uh, Canadian guidance in PIPEDA um, might not actually exist. Um, and coincidentally, um, literally yesterday, this book came out, uh, Artificial Intelligence and Surgery. Um, it's the number one book in uh, urology on Amazon in the States. Um, this book isn't available in Canada yet, but um, we have two chapters in it, uh, one of which uh, I wrote with a, a fantastic PhD student, uh, Vector Raid. Um, on the ethics of artificial intelligence and surgery, and the um, the publishers allowed us to make this uh, paper like available on archive in perpetuity, so you can just check it out yourself if you want. Um, but I want to focus a little bit on some of the topics that we talked about in this chapter, um, and this is where I think we we talk about things mostly about ethics of AI in the surgical context, but I think some of these things also generalize outside of um, the OR uh, specifically. So, um, you know, there's a lot of work preceding AI about ethics in the operating room. Um, we talk about, you know, um, surgery as an intense form of practical ethics. Um, and in particular, it comes down to the idea that while surgery can, you know, is, is, is often involves very um, uh, prolonged experiences and very acute, very dangerous experiences to which these kind of broad top-down committee approved guidelines don't necessarily occur. And there's not enough time to, um, for the team to stop what's going on and turn to these guidelines and then you know, walk through the process and then have a vote and then have it ratified and all this sort of thing. Often we rely on, on surgeons have to make like an immediate decision. Um, and so therefore, you know, um, and these decisions aren't always gonna be captured by these, these kind of top-down um, kind of uh, committee approved guidelines. Um, that isn't to say that those guidelines are not going to be useful. So I'm actually going to talk about three or, or three and a half different kind of guidelines that exist for ethics um, in surgery. But um, that is to say that you know surgical ethics, uh, while being principled, are often very pragmatic, and it, decisions have to be made ad hoc given the very particular situation at the particular moment. Um, and it just I think this also might generalize to machine learning generally. I think there's there's dozens of papers that try to break down um, how AI should be used ethically. Um, and I think just like in the case of surgery, all of these things are valuable, um, but there's always gonna be these kind of new situations that keep on popping up um, when we're continuously deploying AI in these new cases with new data um, and new modeling techniques that maybe these, these techniques didn't necessarily um, foretell. So we need to be able to you know, absorb these, these guidelines, but also have the ability to make ad hoc decisions um, on an as needed basis. Um, 
surgery, I think like machine learning uh, is complete replete with moral contradictions and tons of uncertainties. Like we're not always sure if a particular action is gonna result in a desired outcome. Um, and of course, introducing novel technology in particular AI into this kind of super dangerous environment can potentially increase all of these kinds of challenges that, that we see in, in surgery generally. I like the way that Wall uh, describes um, ethics. Um, so in this paper on ethics and surgery, uh, Wall defines an ethical problem Craig, as, yep. Could I just interrupt you for a sec? Cause mm -hmm. I, I, we had a couple of questions sure, um, sure, sure. and I'm just wondering if I could call on, on, on those um, before we go, go on to this one. Um, Matt, you had a question? Yeah, I mean, I have lots of questions. I mean, I've, I've just enjoyed this so much, Frank, thank you. Um, uh, so much amazing material that you've that you've provided to us here today. Um, I'm actually most interested in this last stuff that you're describing, because I mean, in a way, I see a, I see this is the most <laughs> sort of interesting part. I love the fact that you're using surgery as a case, because I think unlike some of the other AI uses that you've detailed so far, like the derm, you know, uh, dermatology or, or um, uh, uh, radiology kind of examples. Surgery is such a weird <laughs> medical activity. My wife is a surgeon, so I know a little bit about it. She sends me videos sometimes, sort of like that one, you, the picture you showed. Um, it's, it, it's, and I think you captured it actually in that paper that you just showed, because I, I actually <laughs> took a look at it when I saw your, your, um, your abstract. You note that these kind of formal ethical principles that seem to be potentially deployable as, as a way of evaluating the ethics of AI um, are af I actually seem to break down a bit in, a, in the pragmatism of a surgical context. And I think actually we could probably export that to other medical contexts who are often equally non-framework based, but, but much more responsive and reactive. Mm -hmm. So the question I have really is, you know, given that pragmatic choice making activity that is typically happening within the actuality of medical treatment, how can AI systems sort of, you know, make choices that somehow maintain an ethical commitment that is instead of being based in a framework is based on the pragmatics of the moment? Yeah, this is a real great question. I, I, this is something that I, we struggle basically with on a daily or at the very least a weekly basis when we're, we're talking about deploying our models uh, to our um, partners or customers uh, in, in the Thuara black box. Um, I mean, generally, I think we, we try to uh, proceed extremely cautiously, which I'm actually extremely uh, relieved about. Um, like before I kind of joined, you know, um, the impression was that like people were really trying to push AI into healthcare at, at full speed. Like we had the Jeff Hinton quote from the beginning about how like radiologists will be out of a job in five years. And, and when I heard that kind of thing, I was on one hand very excited, but on the other hand, very scared, right? Um, especially if like I'm one of the people who's gonna be deploying AI uh, in practice. And you know, there's the culture that's trying to push it out there and we didn't take the time to really ratify things or you know, test out all the possible ways that things can break down. So in practice, my experience has been that we tend to like try to be extremely cautious um, when, with regards to before we actually deploy anything. And when we do, we normally um, like approach it in the kind of the, um, I like to describe it as the, the Google method um, or the Netflix method in which like we're not actually relying on AI uh, to make a decision. Instead, we're asking the AI to look at the data and to provide us with like, I guess in healthcare it's called a differential, um, but like kind of like a ranking of possible scenarios or possible decisions, or if you have many cases you're looking at and you're trying to find ones in which say distraction is super high, you, you rank them by, by the likelihood of having this data, but there's always a human in the loop, right? Just like when you search on Google and you know, for something you don't, like Google doesn't always say your answer is definitely this answer, or it, it doesn't even tell you your answer is definitely in this page. It'll give you, you know, 20 pages for you to look at and you have to complete the loop. So generally when we're deploying AI in practice, um, our approach is that you know, humans are like always gonna be in the loop um, at basically all stages. And we're just using AI as sort of a way to make things scalable, um, to do a kind of a first pass of the data, but then you know, humans are at the end still the ones making choices. Um, and then you can kind of you know, backtrack. So like if a decision's made, a human's making the decision, is a human making a decision purely on the data or is the data partially um, influenced by the AI. 
if it's the AI, then we also have these explainable methods in place to help us do that. So if, if we're looking for, say, bleeding in, inside the body, um, we'll say, well, here are the pixels that indicate bleeding. Or if we're looking at a medical record and we're trying to predict whether someone's going to you know, need another transfusion or suffer from sepsis, we say, well, here's the text or here's the data that, that um, would suggest it. And then the human will always have access to that. Um, so we're, we're not asking the AI to make ethical decisions at the moment. Um, we're just making sure that when things are being deployed, it's, it's kind of being um, uh, secured um, in, in the, a safe little box and there's still humans outside the box pulling out these decisions. Uh, Mina also had a question, Frank. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So Frank, this was a fabulous, a very, very interesting um, presentation. You talked about so many interesting topics. Um, so I come from more of a social science background and I read your chapter um, and I know that you talked about sort of this implicit, the algorithmic bias um, that is kind of in the algorithms themselves. And to me, that kind of piqued my curiosity on the idea of bounded ethicality, because we talk a lot in psychology about the fact that um, there's intentional and unintentional unethical behavior. And so bounded ethicality comes out when people essentially want to make the right decision, but because of implicit bias or um, you know, conflicts of interest, et cetera, that they're not even aware of, they make the wrong decision that actually goes against their values. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if um, you could talk about maybe the do you think that bounded ethicality, the fact that humans themselves are suffering from these biases that they're unaware of, is that compounded by the bias that's in the, in the algorithms? Or do you think that the algorithms would act to sort of minimize this sort of bias? Um, or what do you think the relationship would be? I think, <laughs> I, I think the answer is going to be a bit of both. I, I, I'm sorry if that sounds like a bit of a guy. Like I'm trying to... I, I, uh, keep my out of the answer, like a definitive answer, but I think sometimes, like generally, I think um, we don't really understand too much about how AI in practice really uh, affects uh, human factors. Like do people choose to ignore the AI if, if possible, or do they choose to just completely accept whatever the AI thinks because it's usually correct? Um, those are kind of the questions that we hypothesize about, but we don't really know yet. So um, when it comes to to what extent AI decisions are going to compound things, I think we need need to you know actually do some experiments. And to do those experiments, we need kind of I think more of theories from social science that we don't normally see in computer science, like the one you mentioned. Um, so those those are yet to be done. Um, but um, like I I'd, I'd love to be able to actually do those those experiments, like um, instead of just um, like so far we've thought about them, but I want to be able to actually run it in practice. Um, uh, that being said, like I, uh, I don't know how much I can I can say about this, but um, um, I guess I, I kind of already talked about the fact that you know humans disagree with each other a lot. I, I had this paper from the very beginning of the talk about how like you know they had this like Eddie 1990 paper where like 50% of the time surgeons said do a surgery, 50% of the times they said they said not to, um, and um, you know we have a lot of of um, kind of. Uh, scores or kind of assessment techniques we use across all of different um, areas of healthcare, which are meant to be objective. Um, like, you know, we just check off these boxes and then we get a score. There's like, you know, your mini mental state exam score says you're, you know, you're 16 and out of 30, therefore you have moderate dementia or something. But then we actually see how humans don't agree with one another. You'll see that these supposedly objective um, scoring techniques don't work. Um, so this came up recently in the surgical context where we were using a very popular surgical grade um, that humans tend to use and they just kind of trust it implicitly. Uh, but then when we showed that, well, there's a lot of inter-annotator disagreement and that actually in this case, we were lucky. Um, humans agreed more with the uh, AI output than they did with each other. Um, there's a glimmer of hope, at least for me, uh, that um, AI could be used to like um, avoid those biases and in, in this, the extent to which we can make those decisions explainable and to the extent to which those decisions are also consistent. You know, um, an AI will make the same decision at eight in the morning or two in the morning. Um, uh, I hope that, uh, that, you know, we go from this supposedly objective system um, to a truly objective system with, with data science and AI. I lost track of time. I'm so sorry, Jillian. I had so much stuff. I didn't get to play all my, my new tracks. Um, um, right. So I'm going I'm to try to wrap this up. I'm going to skip some of the new stuff. Um, sure thing. Um, let's see, can I go back to, there you go.
I, I really, this is one of my new tracks. So again, this paper, um, which again, is, is freely available. Um, uh, I, we kind of break down, you know, the idea that, well, you know, ethics is often a, a, a discussion about choice uh, and how we make choices and what ramifications choices make and so on. So um, the paper talks about, well, you know, AI is often about choice also. We want to, we want to categorize data um, and, you know, well, how do we determine if it's correct? Well, like I was talking about a moment ago, usually, you know, that it depends on human uh, opinions, um, which themselves are sometimes um, not always consistent. Um, and we talked about a couple of different, you know, um, ethical frameworks people have used in, in healthcare. So Prima Facie is extremely popular. Um, um, it's used across biomed biomedical ethics very broadly to establish first principles. And this is normally kind of the underlying, um, like when we talk about informed consent in the healthcare process, normally Prima Facie theory is like behind the scenes um, where we talk about respect for patient autonomy, non-malfeasance and beneficence, which are like not exactly op op opposites, but are related to one another. Um, like non-malfeasance, I mean, is very similar to the Hippocratic Oath idea of doing no harm, but, you know, in surgery, you know, in order to do, in order to achieve some goal, we have, have to temporarily do some harm, or maybe even do some harm that, that lasts for a very long time. Sometimes, like, if you're doing brain surgery, you might have to perform an operation that results in permanent loss of language, but saves the patient's life, for example. Um, and there's a lot of interesting stuff to be said about justice, um, but I'm going to have to go ahead a bit more quickly now. So we have like prima facie theory, um, Little um, in 2001, um, tried to talk about ethics, not as broadly as prima facie, but more um, contextualized to surgery. So he came up with five moral pillars that we have to consider just very generally uh, in surgery. And that has to do with concepts of rescue, the idea that somebody gives themselves over to another person and that the latter is there to rescue them from this uh, horrendous situation. And to some extent, the degree to which the surgeon can rescue them will depend on their devotion to that aspect. They have an emotional connection to the patient. Um, so there's kind of a human factor there. Uh, proximity, you know, a surgeon has access to the patient that the patient normally themselves doesn't have. Um, it's a great ordeal and so on. And I'm gonna have to skip some more. Uh, as we go through these, these, um, these different frameworks, I think they get more and more specific to the, the level at which they're becoming more and more um, mechanized or automatable. So now we have like Wall, again, the same Wall as before. He has this uh, paper, um, sorry, from a book, uh, International Medicine, a Practice Guide for Aid Workers, in which we still break down ethical questions, but now there are no longer like open-ended questions, but questions with definitive answers. And we need to ask these questions before we take a surgery. Um, so it's becoming a bit more automated. You can imagine these kinds of things being deployed into a checklist. Um, so we have questions for stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders? There's a patient, the surgeon, the hospital, the family, and so on. What are the facts? What is the diagnosis? Uh, what are the options? You know, there's a closed set of options for intervention, for example. Even goals and values. I mean, as we go through these clusters, they become a bit more abstract and a bit more subjective, but we can still talk about, you know, goals for each of the primary stakeholders still in, in relatively um, definite terms. So, you know, the goal for the surgeon and for the patient is to survive the operation, for example. Um, and are there any conflicts among these goals? Um, you know, we need to be able to identify them, um, but there's still definite answers to some of these questions. And then finally, this fourth um, framework, Luxton's considerations, I think is even more automatable in the sense that it's even about artificial intelligence. So this is, has to do with Luxton's paper from 2014, recommendations for the ethical use and design of AI. And here it's, it's very like engineering based. So we need to have data logs, audit trails, uh, we need to test uh, our models uh, in different situations, like the, the dermatology paper, make sure that it's not just on white skin, for example. Um, do we follow appropriate privacy laws? Well, these are all things that we know how to do mechanistically within the healthcare system. So this is becoming more and more um, like in terms of ethical frameworks that are automatable, I think. We talk about each of these in the, in the chapter. Um, so just to wrap up a lot of what the conclusion of this chapter was, um, I think just like ethical decision-making in practice and surgery, um, machine learning in practice won't truly be effective if it's only managed by committee. If we go to like one of these guidelines and say we, we, we check off all the boxes, therefore we can, we're, this AI is ethical and ready to use. Um, really, there's going to be unexpected scenarios and we really need exposure to the real world to really assess for um, the use of this, uh, this technology from an ethical perspective. So more stuff. And this is stuff I really would love to have gotten into more, more deeply with everybody. This is more about like self-reflection. So a lot of the discussion today was about how we have this great push for AI in various different disciplines, including healthcare. Um, and sometimes 
we as a community ignore some of the problems with AI and some of the ways things can break down. In some places, we're even kind of antagonistic towards it. We shouldn't use explainable AI because it's going to expose problems of, um, of the models themselves, and therefore it's going to slow down deployment. And we need to be able to deploy this stuff because of the much longer list of, of, of benefits that AI can provide. Um, so often I think about you know this culture of machine learning and how we as a community kind of intersect um, you know across disciplines, say in a university setting, but also with the general public. And this is going to be more controversial, but fortunately for me, I get to skip over most of it. Um, but I think you know we all have blind spots, um, you know, and sometimes the blind spots have to do with the performance of machine learning. And I think illuminating those blind spots, uh, for lack of a better term at the moment, um, is going to is one of our crucial goals and activities we need to undertake now before we really just flow, uh, throw open the floodgates to AI and healthcare generally. So I have two quotes I love here. Um, Education's purpose is to replace an empty mind with an open one. And another one is believe those who are seeking the truth and doubt those who find it. I, I kind of find that we as a community, sometimes we feel very dogmatic about certain things about how machine learning can be used ethically. Um, and we kind of, they, they, they seem safe and they seem obvious. So we kind of stick to those sort of ideas and then um, we're not really willing to kind of explore um, those decisions we come to. They're just sort of, they're laid out for us as if they're dogma. So I have questions that I ask sometimes. Um, are we really scientists in computer science? Uh, are we parrots? And are we raising psychopaths? So I'm gonna just quickly talk on each of these in a moment. I have a quote from one of my committee members when I was a PhD student. He said, any discipline that needs to use the word science in the title is not doing science. And I disagreed very vehemently with my committee member when I was a student. How dare you, of course, we're scientists. But the more I see how the sausage is made, the more his, the quote sort of resonates with me. Um, you know, we, we computer science kind of operates very differently than other disciplines, in particular in healthcare. Um, sometimes we describe our work in machine learning as discovery based, like just give us your data and we'll give you a table of results. We operate in a discovery based manner. We'll say this is just how we do things. Um, but it, it highlights this difference of approach, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying discovery based methods are bad, it's just different. Um, but it also highlights the fact that, you know, unlike other disciplines, you know, we don't often see core computer science papers with a null hypothesis. And having a null hypothesis is one of the core foundations of doing science properly. Sometimes we pretend we have a null hypothesis, like using this new method will increase accuracy, but we don't really follow the proper empirical methods. We don't do statistical um, uh, significance testing. We don't actually construct the experiment carefully. Um, there's usually no formal training in empirical methods in computer science. Um, and some of us have like a different conception of privacy, like just give us your data. Um, sometimes there's, there's a controversy about, you know, whether patients should even have the expectation of privacy um, or whether data scientists and machine learning people should just have all the data. I'm not going to get into that, but, um, you know, there's, there's different people even in our own community who have different perspectives of this. So just wrapping this up, like, are we scientists? I hope that all of us are going to be scientists, regardless of what our discipline is, and even in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, but some questions are, you know, in computer science, is novelty more culturally important than insider reproducibility? When you're getting published, is it more useful to get something that's novel or something that's reproducible? Um, uh, is anecdotal evidence more culturally important than statistical significance? Is it enough to beat a baseline by 0.25 of a percent? Or is it more important to maybe not always work or not actually get statistical significance when comparing against baselines? Is branding and celebrity um, more culturally important than, than anything else really? Um, like we need to use BERT or we need to use another model for natural language processing because that's this expectation that we do, but maybe we don't need to use it in all contexts. You know, there's branding and the celebrity behind some of the trends that we see in computer science. So if the answer to any of these questions is yes, then you know, I'm sometimes worried that we're not actually doing science and we're kind of just entertaining ourselves and pretending we're doing science. And um, if that's the case, then we're, Again, if our goal is to make a positive change in the world, um, we need to do science. We need to really test that things work and evaluate when they don't. Otherwise, we're in for a rude awakening in the not too distant future. Right? Can I just? Yep. Can I just? Um, Avery has a great question, okay. which I think is probably, might be our last. Be, be a good place to to wrap up. Yeah. Oh, um, thanks so much. You know, I just out of curiosity, I saw that the first volume of Don Quixote was on the recommended reading. And I've been thinking, I'm a literature professor, I was thinking the entire time, you know, what were you implying technologically with that? Perhaps um, this might be a short answer. That's a perfect, perfect um, question. 
because it, I was going to use it at the very end. The word quixotic came up at some point, right? Yeah. So I, etymologically, like that, that was, a, I had my head on that for a moment, but I'm just going to conclude. And then the Don Quixote reference is going to just make it up in the very last slide. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, it's perfect for the, for the moment. Um, so I think today I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the risks we're seeing with deep learning and healthcare in particular, how we might mitigate against some of them by using explainable AI. I talked about how we're deploying deep learning in the operating room uh, and some of the ethical considerations of AI in surgery and healthcare that are kind of informing some of our decision-making processes like in the real world currently. Um, I had some sort of critical self-reflection, which I'd love to be able to follow up with, with some of you at some point um, uh, offline um, and uh, discuss at some other point. Um, but um, I think the, the main kind of themes I wanna leave you with is the idea that, well, like we have AI and machine learning are maturing to a point where we can, and we are actually putting them into practice. And there's a, a pull, like there's a lot of people in healthcare that want to automate, that want to scale better and to solve some of the historical problems you saw in healthcare um, generally. Um, we want to improve safety and, um, and we want to improve the objectivity of some of our models. But as we're going to be doing that, and as we're going to be doing that with machine learning and AI, um, these tools that we're introducing into these very dangerous environments uh, to improve safety, we have to make sure that those tools themselves are safe. And there's various ways we can maybe do that. And it's going to take a, a very strong, self-critical cultural um, shift, I think, in our community to, to, to make sure that we're doing the right thing in practice. So this is where the Don Quixote thing comes in. I think at the very early stage, I wanted to highlight some of the ways that AI makes problems. So we had this example where you can take an image and you can take um, a model that is very good at distinguishing it. So maybe with 58% confidence, the model says this is a panda. And then therefore it's right 95% of the time or something. And we had this paper about AI um, being easily fooled where, well, you could add you know, um, a fraction of a percent of this, uh, this artificially generated image to the former, producing this new image that is indistinguishable to us, but suddenly this model, um, uh, you know, hallucinates that it's a given. And you can force these models to hallucinate anything that you want, um, which, which, you know, is not true dissimilar from this image. This is a relatively famous image from Google. They try to kind of show what the model is learning. So it's a generated image from a computer vision system that was meant to kind of like look under the hood in a relatively explainable way um, to say, well, when looking at a tree, what does the neural network actually see? Um, this is what the neural network actually sees in this case. And it looks like a nice kind of uh, impressionist painting. And in it, you can see a bunch of hallucinated things. It might be a face, something looks like a horse over here, and maybe another horse. So other things that are somewhat maybe related to a field and trees, but are not in the original image, but are hallucinated. So this is kind of where the Don Quixote quote comes in. So like I have this wonderful quote um, from Don Quixote. You see over yonder friend Sancho, 30 or 40 hulking giants. I intend to do battle with them and slay them. So um, we, we have an understanding that AI, our models can hallucinate all kinds of crazy things. And it's part of our job to be able to identify when AI is, is actually hallucinating. But I think another thing which we didn't really have time to get too much into is when we as a community are also hallucinating things when we hallucinate that like a particular framework is, appro is appropriate or sufficient, um, or whether our approach to doing what we think is science is actually doing science, it's also a form of self-delusion that sometimes when I see happening, I, I, I think of, of uh, Don Quixote, and I think we need to, um, we need a friend Sancho to help um, guide us as we're actually trying to um, put things into practice. Or another way of putting that finally is this, one of my favorite quotes of all time, Marshall McLuhan, First, we shape our tools. We spend a lot of time devising these systems in the first place and they work pretty well, but as we're putting them into practice, um, thereafter our tools are shaping us. So how does uh, putting machine learning into um, operating rooms in healthcare actually change us? And how do we as a community um, rise to, um, to deal with it uh, appropriately and carefully? Thanks for Great. your time. Thanks, Frank. That was really, really lovely um, and lots of great insights. Really appreciate that. Um, uh, we are, um, uh, we, there's lots of conversation that was, was generating in the chat here. We'll have to follow up with that, that afterwards, um, but uh, really appreciate that. Uh, next week, our speaker is Sarah Matthew. She is an associate professor of the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. And she's gonna be talking on the cultural evolution of cooperative norms. Um, so I encourage you all. I think it's going to be a terrific talk as well. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.